I've asked myself that question at times, how in the world? But I know as I know many of these things just like what's on the board. And uh, I don't believe that many uh, in Christendom, uh, Christendom understand and know this, even in the grace movement. We have a lot of brethren that are Acts 11 and Acts 13 and even Acts 28 as to when the church started. But if you follow the sequence, when Jesus Christ was given a mystery title that is unprophesied, the head of the church, that's when the mystery was unveiled in the third heaven. When Jesus Christ then acting upon that title and the instructions of the Father was sent back to earth, according to the prophetic program, his feet were not to touch the earth again until he came back to establish his kingdom. What's he doing back on the road to Damascus? It's a mystery. No, really it's not. He told Paul what, what he was doing. I'm, I'm uh, appearing to you so that you might be a witness uh, of what's happened here and what's going to happen as I appear and give you grace truth and grace doctrine. Uh, so it's very important to understand that at this point in history, in Acts 9 in the Bible, and in other places where uh, that experience is commented on, that's when God started something different and unveiled something that was a secret only, known only to him until it began to be unveiled at that point. And so therefore we can understand that from the glorious appearing of Christ to the glorious appearing of Christ according to mystery, from the revelation to the rapture, that this is the dispensation of grace. It's unique, it's different, it has connections to the past, but it has a, a brand new scope of things uh, that we are to look at and understand. Now one of those things has to do with with not just the new agency, the church which is his body, but another agency that is founded and unique to this dispensation, and that is the local church. You realize that Adam had what was tantamount to a local church in the midst of the garden, uh, and others uh, had something similar in the patriarchal dispensations when the father of the household was the priest. It's called a, a, a patriarchalism or patriarchal priesthood. Job was one, Noah was one, where, where the eldest uh, male stood uh, between God and the family and offered sacrifices, taught truths, and, and that sort of thing. Under the dispensation of law, you now have a specified priesthood from one of the tribes, Levi. You now have a, a, a temple or a tabernacle where the high priest over not just Israel, but over all spirituality around the world uh, was um, uh, functioning and operating in that particular building. And no one else had a, a monopoly uh, on that except them. They were the exclusive priests. Uh, and representatives of God, then all of a sudden you have a, a brand new agency that the Apostle Paul calls a church, and it is local, and it is grace, and it has someone over it called the pastor-teacher. And uh, that's something that we need to realize because if Pauline truth is being attacked, if Pauline doctrine is being attacked, Pauline agencies are going to be attacked. Paul's people will be, as well as those that are designated of, uh, of Christ to be representatives of this uh, local church. Now let's just look at a couple things here um, in chapter 4. We are in, to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. All right, let's just, uh, with regard to this, we'll, we'll keep it on this page. The unity of the Spirit. Now might I say something that this, this is something that others do not have. Yes, they were united one to another. Uh, yes, there were uh, bonds there. But nothing like the cohesiveness seen by the Spirit of God in the body of Christ in this dispensation. And so therefore the Apostle Paul lists some things that are biological that we have that nobody else has in this dispensation. Note verse number four, there is one body. 
And of course, at other places, he has taught that we are members together one of another. And there's not two bodies of Jesus Christ. There is just simply one. And you have to believe in him to be part of that body. That, but that body is a living organism. It's a biological union. Just like the cells in our body here are united one to another to form our body. Uh, each and every physical body, member of the body of Christ, is part of that one body. One spirit. He is the one who is supervising the entirety of the uh, making or forming of the body of Christ. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling. What is the hope of our calling? The blessed hope, the rapture. What happens then? Every member of the body is brought together as one in the second heaven. Still a biological union. That's when it will be fully realized. Now there are members without bodies in the third heaven. Uh, there, there are saved souls there that will come back with Christ at the rapture. And we will be transformed as we go up. But everybody at that, from that point on has this one hope of together being with the Lord in the second heaven. It's a biological thing. One Lord to whom we're uh, related and united in his deity, not his humanity. One faith. Each and every one of us has, has believed in Jesus Christ and has functioned in the realm of the volition to believe in him. Let's move on here. One baptism. Now, if there's only one baptism, which baptism is it? Water or spirit? It has to be spirit because water baptism only washes the flesh. Spirit baptism places us in, as members into the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Still the biological union. It goes on to, to say, uh, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and so forth. So we are related to the Father in this sense, and we're to endeavor to keep that particular unity and not to confuse the issue. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what, what the unity of the Spirit is, what it does. It is a biological relationship that we have to one another, to Christ, to the Holy Spirit, to God the Father. Uh, and, uh, and in keeping with this one body concept, the agencies God, God is going to use. But I want you to note something else here. In verse number 11, we talked about this, uh, that of what um, Paul does in relation to the two words, pastor, teacher. There are conjunctions known as uh, D-E, duh, and that can be translated and, and it's a continuing thing. But there is a conjunction called chi that if you have a definite article in front of it, and though it's not here, if you go back in the Greek text, there is a definite article in front of the pastor and teacher. And what that does, that is known as the, uh, the Granville Sharp Rule, and it combines those two words to, to, into one particular office. So that means that, that there is a, a, a pastor, teacher, one, and he's to do something. Note, he's there for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, here's another unity. This time it's of the faith. And the word here is theological. Now, what this demands by way of our understanding is that if there can be a unity of the faith, we can all figure out and agree on just what the faith is. Otherwise, there's no unity. If you can have the unity of the Spirit and a oneness there and see and, and function and operate in conjunction with, with this oneness, you can also have a unity of the faith. Now, probably personally, with regard to opinions and likes and dislikes, we will never, ever come to an agreement. And we could use all sorts of illustrations. I don't want to gross you out again with my particular pet uh, 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 likes and dislikes with food or other things. But theologically, you better come to a common understanding. For example, how to get saved. Are there two ways to get saved? Five ways to get saved? There's only one. Believe in Christ. Uh, and without works, that's important to add. But that's a theological commonality. 
that is something that you did and I did uh, uh, that, that we share in common. And it's one Savior that we share in common. What he did on the cross for us, how he deals with us, all those things are commonalities that we now begin to study, uh, not just individually, that's important, but you'll note Paul mentions the unity of the Spirit first and then the unity of the faith second. We're placed in the body of Christ. Now we have to have the mind of Christ play, placed in us. There's a biological union. There is a theological union. Now let's come back to a little bit of Greek study in uh, verse number um, 12. Note the three fours. <laughs> it's F-O-R, not F-O-U-R. Two of these are the Greek word ice. One of these is the Greek word pros. All three of them are in the accusative of intent, which means there's a purpose for this. Why did God give the uh, pastor teacher? Four, four, four. Now, this, this matter of Ice is for the purpose of, and it's the last two fours there in verse number uh, 12, for the work of the ministry. He is involved in preparing you to live for Christ during your time on this earth, in this generation, right now. He is also prepared uh, to edify the body of Christ. That, that's the building of the edification complex, your human spirit, the growth rings, the rainbow uh, concept uh, for your coming work on, on a future throne. But there's something that else that you have to do. And that is understand the first four for the perfecting of the saints. Anytime you have pros plus uh, excuse me, I didn't, it's, it's yeah, the, the accusative of intent. Plus the accusative, you have a translation meaning face to face. All right? Now, one of the reasons that I say that is that will indicate, right, pastor, teacher, videotapes, audio tapes, books, all those things are well and good in their place. But in order to fulfill the, the verse, it has to be face to face. That's what it says. Pros plus the accusative, accusative of intent means that it is a face to face type teaching. Where we're where eyeball to, to eyeball, face to face. I'm looking at you and the, car, the flock is, is looking back at the shepherd and, and so forth. And that's, that's how it's done because that's what Lucifer, that's what Satan and his group did not want to do. Jesus Christ would get up and, and he would begin teaching uh, the Word of God. He would begin teaching the angels. Uh, even in eternity future, we're still going to be under his ministry of teaching uh, as well as that of others. But he's going to be teaching. Satan didn't want that. And so, because we are going to be in the very heavens uh, that Satan ruled as the anointed cherub that covered it all, he is forming a, a, a group of people to do that by face-to-face -face teaching in a local assembly. And every time you come to church in obedience of, of that concept, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go see my pastor teacher. Now, just before anybody makes any comments, uh, that doesn't make the pastor teacher some sort of saint or God or to be worshiped or, or to, to separate you from reality or your own common sense or thinking or be dictatorial to you in, in areas and, and that sort of thing. But it is that Jesus Christ gave this pastor teacher as his representative on earth. Uh, the, the, the patriarchs were representatives. The prophets were representatives. They were sent ones. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, who was authorized. What The man God sent. The man God authorized. Jesus Christ took up the banner. Then the apostles and so forth. Now, then we had Paul. And uh, leading now to the pastor teacher. Now, one more uh, time with regard to this. That's why our insistence on this matter of 
of other pastors and parachurch organizations. You must be in a place where you're in face-to-face -face teaching, which is being rejected hands down amongst uh, uh, Christians today. It's everything but face-to-face -face teaching. And that is the system that, that Christ established. When, when you have a parachurch organization and somebody who is a thousand miles away from you, that this concept cannot be fulfilled. Now, we are not saying that those in parachurch organizations cannot provide a valid service for us. They are uh, uh, limited in what they do, but they specialize in what they do. And because they specialize in certain aspects of ministry, we can glean from, from what they say. But, but coming to a pastor teacher who is interested in feeding you the whole realm of doctrine is the will of God for, for our lives. And it has to be in, in a face-to-face -face setting. So that's the question, as we said this morning. Um, there comes a time when people simply have to pick. Who is it? The guy down the street? And you ask, what does he teach? Um, is it the gal down the street? What does she teach? Uh, she calls herself a pastor, and people go to her. Yet, she could never be. Jesus Christ only gives demotic gifts to men. And if it's somebody who teaches false doctrine, and, and doctrine's not even saved, you can't get the demotic gift, which is a second gift, unless you're first saved. He can't be your pastor. Well, but look at the size church. Look at the beautiful edifice. Look at the program they've got. Look at all this, that, and the other. It doesn't matter. Is, is he saved by the grace of God? Does he have the demotic gift? Is he teaching the truth of the word of God? Is he acting in the best interest of his congregation and not in his own best self-interest? Is he trying to get a name for himself, build his career, build his coffers and, and like uh, many of the others? Are? Or is he up there willing to get in the trenches with his people and, and fight this out doctrinally so that they're benefited and, and blessed and so forth? Now, I must admit, um, I, I do have an ulterior uh, motive because if you are blessed and rewarded to the maximum at the Bema seat, and I had a part of it, uh, there is a, a sharing of the rewards. There is a benefit there, and uh, I am looking forward to that. That's why I say, root for you. Grace Fellowship Chapel, get in there. Start fighting. Start learning. Uh, start applying the doctrine because when we get there, we want maximum blessing. Okay, now let's go back to the book of Isaiah. And with the time we have remaining, we're, we're going to head back into the heavens. Isaiah chapter 40. And we'll have a brief bit of review bringing us up to date in a place we visited a few weeks back. And I don't want you to forget where we were. We talked about the point of creation and that Jesus Christ spread creation out as a tent, having curtains. There was a beginning point, and once he did this, he then lined the inner lining of creation, these curtains, with a looking glass so as to keep the light and the darkness in and to, to form this boundary. He then, says the book of, of uh, Proverbs, slapped a compass on the face of the deep. He gave us navigational orientation, north, south, east, and west. He then... Uh, uh, of course, that, he created the uh, third heaven there so that he and the Father could sit upon their thrones, and he created the angels. And they had quite a, a conference there, quite a discussion there on I'm the Father, he's my son, here's what you are, here's how it's going to be. Then Jesus Christ stepped out and created their universe where they're going to live forever. And uh, angels are bigger than men, but still, compared to the vastness of the universe, they're quite small, and they saw the glories and the intricacies and the precision of this, uh, this vast um, uh, creation and uh, uh, shouted for joy. Then he created some things we're going to uh, talk about tonight in just a little bit. 
and that was uh, the the stars, Jacob's ladder, the earth, the heaven uh, above the earth. He created the thrones uh, and so forth. And one other thing that we did, we're going to um, just quickly bring to your uh, memory. He created the third heaven, and this is uh, th this was the first thing that he created in actuality. And it has there some things that he's going to put on the earth under the first heaven. That is, a mountain, Mount Zion, is in the third heaven. It was there before it was on earth. A temple, he's going to put that on, on uh, uh, the earth as well, but it was in the third heaven before it was on earth. Jerusalem as a city, the heavenly city, is in the third heaven before it was on earth. He's going to put Jerusalem back on earth. The tree of life, water, clouds, and so forth. All of these things were there. Uh, and uh, then we have Jacob's ladder. We might uh, come back to that. My time is uh, slipping here. But uh, it, it opens up just like it's shown here. You can go up or down in it. The angels uh, ascending, descending. Uh, they can have contact with the earth or go back up to heaven. But here's where we want to get to. All right. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 22. And it says there, he, or let's go to verse 21. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? And of course, there is a biblical evidence and documentation that the earth is in the center of the universe. Uh, that uh, from, from this point up to the earth is a, is a certain length and distance, and from this point up to the third heaven, a certain length and, and, and distance, and, uh, and uh, as far as the horizontal is concerned as well. But around the earth and, and up here to the north, is where Jacob's ladder intersects with something God calls the circle of the earth. And the circle of the earth is where you can leave the earth anywhere around, uh, on the earth, hit, the, uh, we'll call it a, uh, a bypass. <laughs> you know, in the interstates, you've got a town and they'll have a bypass where you can slip around. We'll just call it a bypass. You can hit it and slip around the earth, come up to the north and shoot right up to the third heaven. And we know that this is true because, verse 22 says, he that sits upon the circle of the earth. Jacob's ladder goes from the third heaven down to the earth, but according to the doctrine of the north, it stops above the north pole uh, and, uh, and ends there. Well, how do the angels get around the earth from that point? If they're looking to go warp speed, it's this circle around the earth. But note what it says. He sits upon, here's where his throne is located. He sits upon it. Uh, he's, he's on the highest part of it, and he is connected to it. All right, now there's another thing we want to look at in Job chapter 22. Turn to the book of Job chapter 22. I believe that this teaches that God uh, also, through the Lord Jesus Christ, created something for him to walk around the universe. And that this is how, uh, it, I, I drew this as, as blue simply because it gave, provided a background, but in actuality, uh, the circle and this square, uh, the backdrop should be all yellow, but it, it, was, um, it was hard to see because it was so bright, so I just did that. But uh, this particular part here is what we're talking about with the universe, uh, the backdrop should be yellow. Anyway, 
Just as God created a passageway around the earth called the circle of the earth that he sits upon, a passageway called Jacob's Ladder from the north into uh, north uh, a part of the earth to the southern part uh, of, uh, of the third heaven, he also created a passageway for him to walk exclusively around. Note verse number 14. Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not. He walks in the circuit of heaven. Now, the same words are used with regard to, um, to both a circle or a pathway. It is a circuit. This is, this is where the third heaven is located up here, but God walks around it this way, walks around it this way, walks around it this way, and can enter it through passageways that he has uh, uh, all around there in order to get to earth. Now, just follow with me one, one quick second as we move to Job chapter 38. Now there's a reason that he, he does that. Uh, I believe that God has secret passageways as well as visible ones, tangible ones. Uh, and it's shown to us in the book of Job uh, and uh, indicated in something he calls the treasures of the snow and the treasures of the hail. So follow with me, uh, Job chapter 38, and uh, God is rebuking Job a little bit in verse number four. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Uh, Job wasn't even thought of except in the mind of God at that time. He did not exist. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if you know, or who has stretched the line upon it? I mean, there was a measuring line that, uh, that I used. It's an invisible one, but it's still, it's still there. And I made the earth so big, a diameter, circumference. Uh, and I laid the foundations with regard to uh, the right distance from the sun so that gravity would pull it around and there would be a circuit there. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Now, remember, all of these things are things that God is challenging Job with. Do you, do you see him, Job? Were you there? Can you tell me where these secret things are? They're nonetheless real, but are, uh, uh, can you point them out to me? Uh, where, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now let's move on down to uh, verse number 10. Who break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors? God's decreed place is where he laid uh, the foundations of in the original uh, earth so that he could set his city upon the earth. And that's where these foundations are located. All right, let's move on. Verse 11. Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Here are thy proud waves to be stayed. In other words, there, there are boundaries. And, and, uh, and God is setting these things up. But to Job, he didn't know how to do it. He didn't know where they were. Have you commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? You don't know the place of the day spring, as, as it were, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and shake, uh, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. There, there are some secret things, Job, that I know that you don't know. The creation doesn't know. But I'm going to utilize these things against the wicked at a certain time. All right, let's move on. Verse number 15, from the wicked their light is withholden. The high arm shall be broken. The high arm is a reference to Lucifer, who, who, who with his uh, fist clenched in the face of God, I'm going to defeat you, God. I'm going to take the battle to the third heaven. In fact, then God's going to turn around and bring the battle to the earth. From the wicked their light is withholden, the high arm shall be broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea? There are, there are currents 
There's water uh, coming out of the earth into the oceans, uh, causing the, these currents and so forth. Uh, mariners understand them, especially sailors understand them to take boats in a certain way. But can you figure them out, Job? Do you know where they originate? Do you know where the day spring originates? Well, I've got, uh, I, I realized that the pastor was buggy, but I've just, um, I've just eliminated two bugs. I've waged a war on two bugs. Um, have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been opened to thee? Now, we've discussed before where the gates of death are. One of the main gates of death or hell is in uh, the, the Red Sea right where Israel came across. But, uh, but as far as Job finding them, he can't. It's secret to him. It's unknown. Hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? These are the gates of hell that will be opened and you go through to the depths of the earth. Jesus Christ made that passage and he evacuated those that were captive. Have you perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way where the light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? Now let's go back to this, uh, this original, um, uh, uh, this slide here. Here's where the light dwells here. Well, Joe, how do you get to it? And have you been to, to the place where darkness is contained? Let's read on. That you should uh, take it to the bound thereof. Do you know how to get to the end of the universe? And that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof. There are paths there. Now, Knowest thou it because uh, thou wast then born whenever creation, uh, uh, whenever I was uh, creating all these things? You were born then, you saw them, you witnessed these secret things. Did you know them, Job? Of course not. Or because uh, the number of your days is great? And now here he asks the question that brings us to, to this point here. Have you entered into the treasures of the snow? You have before you here a, uh, a snowflake. And the treasures of the snow are valuable secret pathways from God, from the circuit in which he alone walks into the universe so that he can materialize, he can localize any place he wants to in the universe at any time. Now, just stay with me and you'll see it eventually. He also says then, last part of verse 22, or have you seen the treasures of the hail? The hail concept is the, the circle. And if you break open um, uh, hail and open it up, it has this very same type pattern in it. Now, why does God say that? Simply because... The snowflake and the hail indicate pathways from the outskirts of the universe into the inside of the universe where that God himself can take to materialize. How do we know? Look at the, look at the next verse. God is reserving the treasures against the time of trouble. God is reserving these treasures, these pathways these secret things that the Job doesn't know, but he said, I put them there in the original creation. You weren't born at that time. You don't have that many days under your belt. But when I was there and did all this, I put them and there are, if you look at the snowflake and at the hail, you, uh, you can see that they're there. I have reserved these treasures or pathways against the time of trouble and against the day of battle and war. Now, let's uh, simply then come to understand that upon the universe, God has, has put these, these, these snowflake uh, patterns so that he can enter in from, from any direction that he wants at any time. Creatures of his universe are only allowed in the highest or the third heaven. He walks in the circuit of the heavens around here and has pathways inside whenever there's war. 
Uh, he himself can be there. He himself can witness it. He himself can apply pressure. He himself can uh, um, uh, uh, be, be present at any given place that he wants to. All right. Any, uh, this is maybe new material, maybe new to you. Any questions on this? We've got just a few minutes left. Any questions on what we're talking about here? No questions? We're awfully, awfully quiet. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, be quiet. Let's go to, um, at this point, let's note the biosphere concept, and we're just about done. Psalms 148. One more thing just before we close this out and have one more lesson, 16, we'll finish them up, make them even. Psalms 148. Remember again, just before we close out the treasures of the snow and the hail, what God is showing to, to Job is pathways, secret things built into the universe whereby he can enter into the universe from north, south, east, or west. Job can't find them. They're secret places, but he knows where they are. And, and they are patterned after these, these things, just like the universe, it has specific patterns. He calls them treasures because they are valuable to him, especially as it said, in the time of war and in the time of trouble. Okay, we believe that there is a, an atmosphere in the third heaven, and we're just gonna look at a few verses and quit on these, and if there is any questions, you can ask at that point. Note, Verse number four, praise him, ye heavens of heavens. Now that lets us know that there's atmospheres out there around other planets. But it's also a special looking toward the third heaven. And what it says there, ye waters that be above the heavens. We've already shown that in other places, uh, God, uh, in other verses, that God has water in the third heaven. Now, let's see what he's done with this water in the book of Amos chapter 9. Book of Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9 and verse number 6. The, the biosphere or ecosphere concept where it says in Amos 9, 6, he, he that builds his stories in the heavens and hath founded his troop on the earth, he that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. There's water in the third heaven. Obviously, he used Jacob's ladder to fill up the sea with the water from there. As a matter of fact, uh, if, if uh, you note him planting the Garden of Eden, he brought forth some, some plants, but he also planted some things himself that we believe he brought from the third heaven to the earth. All right? Let's note some other things about this, and we'll, we will quit here. Let's go one more thing. Psalms, 100 and, uh, Psalms 102 and then Job and we're done. Psalms 102, verse number 19. His dwelling place is in the third heaven. His sanctuary is in the third heaven. His throne is in the third heaven. The third heaven has cities, has temples, has mountains, has clouds, has water, has trees, has flowers. And 
In verse number 19, it says, and this is how we also get the, the canopy or uh, biosphere um, uh, concept. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven, that's the third heaven, did the Lord behold the earth. He sits on the circle of the heaven, of, of the earth rather. And so therefore he can simply open up Jacob's ladder at any time and look straight down and see what's happening on the earth. Also he can walk in the circuit of the earth and with his pathways he can enter at any place in the universe. Those are the treasures of the snow and hail. Job chapter 22 and that's it. This is called, of course, the third heaven, all those things. Verse 12, we're done. Is not God in the height of the heaven? In the height of the heaven, you have the heavens of the heavens. In the heavens of the heavens, you have water in uh, uh, the heavens. There are clouds there. Behold the height of the stars. Okay, that's how high are they? God is higher than that. Uh, and uh, that's why it's called... Um, uh, that's why we believe that it is just like this tent, but that there is a, it is outside of the tent itself in a canopy fashion.